namaste all uh, the students the parents and everyone who are uh, watching us uh, uh, online so today uh, is a day where uh, we have yet another interaction uh, no as we all know who are uh, frequently following our youtube channel uh, all of us know a series of videos on diverse topics had been happening at our institution uh, uh, be it health be it uh, food nutrition be it information technology be it education uh, be it career guidance there had been diverse aspects in which uh, we have had uh, interaction uh, thanks to the able guidance of uh, our principal uh, dr gayatri uh, ramachandran uh, we have yet another uh, alumni initiative happening today uh, that way i am extremely happy that we are having an interaction on topic of paramount importance uh, that is uh, online safety you know these days i do remember there was uh, uh, memes which were shared uh, a few months back uh, which said uh, like this uh, no students were uh, banned from using gadgets at uh, schools and universities now that universities and uh, schools have got into gadgets so that went viral so that way uh, using technology yes of course there are uh, certain hitches but definitely when there is no option i feel that it is absolutely necessary that we use it the right way in that context i am extremely happy to have uh, uh, mr harihara subramanian here with all of you uh, you know who would be interacting on uh, um, problem solving and uh, uh, programming related to online platform and of course he will be answering questions on global cyber safety and uh, uh, security uh, extremely happy to have you hariharan uh, right from usa you know i i think it's going to be late evening uh, for you and in spite of that uh, you have uh, joined us thank you for that uh, let me just uh, share the profile of uh, mr hariharan uh, with you all children so harihar subramanyam is a graduate student with the department of computer science and uh, information technology specializing in computational biology and bioinformatics at the university of uh, maryland uh, college park he obtained his graduation in uh, computer science from sastra university uh, so that is where you know we got into contact with uh, mr hari is what i would have to say because uh, our alumni uh, ms purnima was uh, a part of a uh, faculty member there in the department of computer science and that is how uh, we got the contact of mr hari and uh, uh, he did a project for 6 months in the university of politecnica catalonia in barcelona spain so again that was on cyber safety and security and that's exactly the reason why uh, he's the apt person i feel uh, that uh, we should be asking questions related to cyber safety and security uh, and uh, he prior to his graduation he has worked for almost 3 years in the research wing of uh, tcs uh, innovation labs at iit madras research park and he was uh, a part of uh, cyber physical systems Uh, uh collaborating with uh, projects on engineering mechanical engineering and uh, hvacr systems that is related to air conditioning and uh, air circulation and uh, heat and thermodynamics you know i also had to do a bit of google search to understand certain aspects of uh, uh, his profile you know it is his magnanimity that he has made it very short and uh, crisp Uh, i know to qualify yourself for a research scholar in uh, a university that to a premier university like university of maryland in usa you need to prove your credentials and uh, before i conclude i would definitely children uh, would like to add one aspect uh, a week before when i was interacting with uh, mr hari he was mentioning about uh, uh, him being a part of a school project uh, i was asking him as to why is it that he chose one aspect of uh, uh, problem solving in computing uh, why not something else programming or something like that no he did mention at school he had uh, been a part of a workshop conducted by planetarium in trichy and by the way let me also say that he's not a lelian he's from our native uh, town uh, or uh, state for that matter 
uh, Tamil Nadu. He was in Trichy. His schooling was in Trichy, so that you can connect with him much better. So he was mentioning that he did uh, he did attend a uh, workshop uh, conducted by the planetarium in Trichy, and that inspired him. So we need to draw inspiration from people around and what is happening around us, and be a part of every event uh, that is happening. So these are certain learnings that we have to take from this session. And one more thing I would like to add is that uh, you know computer is something which many of us are passionate. I know, and he know you know he's taking up a project on bio biology related computing. So interdisciplinary approach is one aspect that as uh, kids, uh, even adults for that matter, you know, we should all acquire. So with these uh, few words over to you, Mr. Hariharan, and I am happy that uh, uh, so many children are part of this session. Over to you, Hariharan. Please take it forward. Uh, thank you so much, Pam. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, so today I've chosen to talk about problem solving and programming. I've called it fun with problem solving. At the end of this session, we would know if it was fun or not. So let's just leave the fun aspect uh, aside. But I'm sure I, I'll try to make it uh, as interesting as I can. Oh, oops, I forgot to share my uh, screen. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you can see my uh, screen. Uh, can you all see my screen? Cool. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so I moved on to the next slide. I hope that works. All right. Yes. So, so before I actually begin my uh, talk, I would like to have uh, a few ground rules set. So we are going to keep our ears and mind open. So whatever goes inside, let it go inside. So let's not worry if, you know, a, a few things just fall out. Okay. So I want you all to keep your ears and mind open. And let's put on our thinking cap. Uh, so it's a idiom in English, which means that we're going to think. So let's put on a thinking cap and then let's just keep this interactive. So once I actually get uh, going into the session, I'm, I'm going to want many of you to unmute and talk. So uh, only if it's interactive, I think it's going to be interesting both to you guys and the people that are going to watch later. Otherwise, it's just a soliloquy. I, I'd like to have a dialogue. And then there's nothing, uh, uh, there are no stupid questions. There's nothing called a stupid questions. Answers can be stupid, but questions can never be stupid. So stop me whenever you have a question and then just feel free to ask any kind of question, right? So uh, just feel free to ask questions. And finally, we'll think out loud. So then I ask you a question, you're, you're gonna uh, think out loud, which means that you're gonna, uh, discuss your thought process with me. You're gonna, you're gonna answer back, right? You're not just gonna keep uh, what you're thinking to yourself. So it's going to be a discussion, right? So if you all have consensus on, consensus on this, let me move on. Is that cool? All right, uh, I, I take the silence as a yes, so cool. So let me move on. I'm gonna start my session with something as, uh, as informal as it can be. So let's talk about cupcakes. I know it's, it's your breakfast time, so if I'm going to make you guys hungry, sorry about that, but I want to start off with cupcakes, right? So let's make cupcakes, and then you're going to tell me what we need to make cupcakes. I have a few hints there, but come on. So can you tell me things that you need, for, need to make cupcakes? You know what cup, cupcakes are, right? I'm sure like at least during the lockdown, baking has become the global hobby for a lot of people. People have been, people that do not have oven have been using cookers to make cakes. There's been different kinds of cakes, egg, egg, eggless cakes and whatnot. So what do we need to make cupcakes? Any, any takers? Just feel free. Let me start. Let's say sugar. Flour. If, you, if you're shy, you... sorry? Flour. Yeah, we need flour. What else? Eggs. You need eggs, that's right. We have eggs there. Butter. There's butter. That's nice. Baking powder. 
we need baking powder we might need baking soda i don't have baking soda there right milk we need milk that's right depending on your taste you might need flavoring agents like fruits chocolate and what not but there's one important thing that i have missed what is it that I have missed what is the most important thing that you need to make a machine which is needed sorry the machine which is needed for the that's right so there's an oven so i have an oven there so that's that's important when you want to make it in a large scale but but i'm missing something what is it that i'm missing maida uh that's flour so somebody said flour so we have flour we have all these things sorry milk salt oh okay there is okay i missed salt but yeah salt is a good one but you you guys have been talking about things that are required to make uh, a cupcake but what is it that you need to make a cupcake without this you cannot make cupcakes so let's say i give you all these things can you still make a cupcake so let's say you're new to the kitchen and you ask for all these things i give you all these things in measured quantities can you still make cupcakes so you let's say i take a pan oh you need a mixing bowl right you need utensils but apart from that there is one another thing that i'm missing so let's say i give anything that you ask for i give you bowls i give you an oven i give you uh, i give you milk i give you sugar yada 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 and then can you just throw everything into the bowl and then put it in the if you shove it in the oven can you make cupcakes i should think well, how to do that that is right so that's the most important thing so let's call it recipe so recipe is the most important thing for you to make the cupcake so without without the recipe you you'll not be able to make a cupcake right fine so let's just keep that in mind and let me just move on so now i've titled the slide what matters the most is it the method or the mode so here i have uh, different names of cupcakes in different global languages and probably this is how they would look uh so these are some interesting cupcakes from uh, a nearby pastry shop that i that i visit often so so what is one thing that is constant across all these uh all these different versions of cupcakes if you if you would like to call it that way what is one thing that is common to all these things Okay, so let's say uh, I I can actually spot German there, and I can see uh, uh, French there. I can see uh, English there. So let's say I invite uh, the best bakers from France, Germany, England, and USA and India, and I ask them to make cupcakes. What is one thing that will be constant across all these things? So one thing is that it will be edible. So whoever makes it, it's going to turn out like cupcakes. And the second thing is that we can all probably agree with our loss of generality that whatever they make would turn out to be cupcakes so what is one thing that is sort of tying every thing together so as somebody just previously said the basic recipe to make the cupcake is going to remain constant right uh, they might call sugar by different names they might call the flour by a different name but one thing that is constant is the set of instructions that you use to make a cupcake is going to be constant so now tell me what is the most important thing is it the method or the language in which you write the instructions so let's say i i ask a german to make cupcakes i'm going to give instructions in german but the instructions are going to be the same right so like that to solve any problem the most important thing is the method right the method is going to be constant you might instruct your computer in many different ways you, you might instruct your computer in html you might instruct your computer in c++ you might instruct your computer in python but the problem that you're going to solve is that the method to solve the problem is going to be the same right so that's what my talk is going to be about it's going to be about problem solving i'm not going to talk about different methods in computer science one can use to solve problems but in general i'm just going to introduce you to problems that use that assume very simple mathematics on the uh, on the on the on the audience uh, and then we're just going to focus on how to solve these problems right so every time you have a problem think of it as cupcakes right the language you use to express your idea is not really important 
uh, you can use any language that you are comfortable and the computer is comfortable, of course, uh, to express the solution. But the most important thing is the thought process that leads to the solution, right? So do we have consensus on this? So do we agree? Uh, so can we agree uh, to whatever I said? Can we agree with whatever I said? Is that fine? Cool. So I see one thumbs up, so I'm just going to move on, right? Cool. Okay, so do you all have a pen and uh, a paper uh, right next to you guys? If not, can you just quickly go, go grab a, a sheet of paper and a pencil? So once you're done, just give me a th uh, thumbs up and then uh, we can get going. All right, I, I've seen a few uh, thumbs up going on, so let's get started, right? Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to draw a few shapes. A anybody can try this, so teachers can also try if they're interested, so, so let's, let's just uh, get going. Um, so I'm gonna ask you to draw a few shapes, but there's just one constraint. You have to draw the shape without having to lift your uh, hand off of the paper, and then, you can draw each line in the in the shape just once. You cannot draw go over the line multiple times. Is that clear? So let me just give you an example with a very simple shape, and then and then let's 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 go uh, let's go about doing that, right? So the first the first figure that you see here is a rectangle. So you have to draw. You can start anywhere, and then you have to draw this shape without having to lift your uh, hands off of the paper. And then th there are four lines in the paper, right? You can just, uh, four lines in the shape, right? You can go over each line exactly once. So can you do this? Can you, can you try this? Can, are you able to do it? Can you draw this shape without having to lift your hands off of the paper? That's right. I can see uh, Anandi ma'am has done it. And then a few other people have also done it. That's great. Cool, so you can do it, fine. So I'm just circling it with the green, which means that you are you can do it, right? So now this is a slightly uh, complex figure, but can you do that? Can, can you try doing this without having to uh, lift your hands off of the paper? That's cool. I see a few S's, right? How about this? I'm sure this is simple too, right? Because these are just, uh, it's like short circuiting a circuit, so it should be easy. That's great. Fine. And this is uh, slightly complex, but can you do that? Can you do this? So A on A, you can't do this in Zoom, right? There's no icon for this, that's right, okay. So can you do this? Can you, can, are you able to draw this without having to lift your uh, pencil off of the paper? You can't. Let's come back to this a little while later. How about this one? That's great. I can see uh, Nityashri has done it. Yes, there's Mohan Apriya. She has also done it. The principal ma'am has done it, so that's great. I'm happy. Well, uh, quite a few of us have done it, so let me move on to the next figure. How about this one? So you can start off anywhere, so just remember that you don't have to necessarily start off from a set point. Oh, 
Okay. So let me move on to the next shape. That's a little more interesting. How about this one? Are you able to do it? Subhashini says she's able to do it. Are you sure? Can you draw this shape without having to? Uh... Yes, yes, sir. Sorry? Yeah. Can you do that without having to take your hands off of the paper? Remember that you can, you can go over each line just once. You cannot circle back again and again. Can you do it? That's, that's interesting. Maybe you're cheating. Are you? So how many of you are not able to do it? Let me ask this guy. I think it's easier to, to raise your hand for that. Right, so I can at least see a few people not being able to do it. That's right, only if you're not able to do it. Okay, well, so you cannot draw this. I bet you, you cannot draw this. Okay, well, how about this one? This is this is interesting, but yeah, can you do it? Well, one person has already done it, so. I can see a few few hands going on. Anandi ma'am, try a little harder, you can get it. Well, so you can do it. Uh, let me move on to the next shape. Probably this is the last one. Okay, so I tell you, you cannot draw this. Uh, for the want of time, I'm not gonna uh, spend some more time on this, but I tell you, you cannot draw this. So you can try it for yourself. And finally, this one complex uh, figure, this reminds me of all my engineering graphics and the horrors, but yeah, uh, I'm sure you'll not be able to do this, right? So what's the whole point of the activity? So somebody, let's say somebody gives you a shape like this, uh, and then they ask you this question, can you draw this without having to lift your pencil off of the paper? And then you can visit each edge just once. Just by looking at it, can you, uh, can you give me an answer? No, yes, no. It's hard, right? So just by looking at the shape, it's hard to say whether or not you can, uh, but now, Let's look at all these figures uh, closely and then see what's common to all of this. So what's common to all of the green ones? What's, what's the property that all the green ones have that the red circles do not? Okay, do you want a hint? Shall I give you all a hint? Okay, so can I give you all a hint? Maybe that would make it easier, okay? So, uh, you should look at the vertices. You know what a vertex is, right? If you all know what a vertex is, give me a thumbs up. Okay, so uh, can one of you tell me what a vertex is? So just to make sure that we are all on the same page. It's okay, it can, be, it can be a crude definition of what a vertex is. It need not be uh, the right one. If not, I can just go ahead and tell you what a vertex is, right? Vertex is like a junction. It's the point where two lines meet, right? So these sharp points are the vertices and the, and the flat lines are the edges. So now look at the uh, sharp points and then see what is the, what is something that's common to all the green ones that the red ones do not have. Maybe it could be, uh, 
So, so let's say I ask you to look at the vertices. What is what are the properties of a vertex that you can think of? So let's say I ask you to describe. I'm asking you to describe this vertex. How would you do it? Can someone try? It's okay. There's no right answer to this. So let's say I ask you to describe this vertex. Can you all see the pointer? The red uh, moving dot, right? So I ask you to describe this vertex. Describe this point. How would you do it? So can someone unmute and try? Edges so or corners? This is a corner, but I, so this is a corner and this is a corner and this is a corner, right? Okay, so can you please unmute yourself? You just answered right now, right? So I I forgot to notice who unmuted uh, who unmuted and answered. Answer. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. So can you look at this vertex? How how are these two vertices different? What is one thing that how would you describe this vertex? So let's say I show you a painting and then I ask you to describe it. You would describe it somehow, right? So I ask you to describe, yeah. So how would you describe this vertex? It has three lines joined together. That is wonderful. Is it three lines or four lines? Four lines. Four lines. So that is the only property you can think of at the moment, right? There's, there's nothing yes. complex to think about the vertex. So now can you look at the vertices of uh, the shapes that are enclosed in the green bubble? and then see what is common to them. Okay, let's go, let's go about doing it. So how many, uh, how many lines meet at this vertex? Just show our fingers, it's four, right? Cool, so at this point, two. Cool. At this point, four again. And at this point, it is four again, right? And at this junction, it's still four. And at this junction, you have two. And at this junction, you have two. So let's just remember this. And let's take this figure, right? How many uh, edges, how many lines meet at this point? That's three, that's right. Here. What about this? That's right. And what about this? And what about this? Four. It, it's four, right. So what is the difference between these two? Just these two shapes. The vertices are same. The vertices are same, but what about the number of lines that meet at this vertex? So you have four vertex, four, four lines meeting at this point. You have three lines meeting at this point. So what can you say about this? What is four and what is three? What is so peculiar about the number four and what is so peculiar about the number three? How, how are they different? What kind of number is three? Square root, square root. So all of them form a square. Uh, sorry, all of them form form a square, right? So so you're saying four is two square, but three is not. Is that what you're trying to say? Sorry. Three is a triangle. So when three lines meet, uh, it's not a triangle, right? So a triangle is a closed sh shape, but three lines when they meet together, they just form a junction, right? They do not form a triangle. Forget the lines, but just tell me what is the difference between the number three and number four? How, how would you differentiate number three and number four? Three is odd three number. Is odd and number. Four is That's even. beautiful, right. So three is an odd number, whereas four is an even number. So in some sense, can we say, if all the vertices in the shape have even number of lines coming into them, you'll be able to draw the shape without having to lift your pencil off of the paper. Can you do that? Can we say that? Can you look at the other examples and verify? Right. So now, just to uh, 
mess with you guys, I'm going to go over to this, this shape, right? How many vertices you have? Uh, how, many, what, how many lines can you see at this vertex? That's three. And what about this one? That's three. So this violates the, 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 the law that we stated previously, right? So let's just make a small amendment to that. Let's say that if there are exactly two vertices that have odd number of lines uh, meeting at that junction, and then all the other vertices have even number of lines meeting at that junction, then you'll be able to draw without ha you'll be able to draw that shape without having to lift your pencil off of the paper. So that's the that's the norm, right? So that's something that it's purely by observation. I'm not going to prove it, right? This is purely by observation. So now, if you know this law, can you let's say you know this law, and I'm I'm going to give you a, a shape. Now, can you say without having to actually draw? Can you say if you can draw that shape without having to lift your pencil off of the paper? Can you do that now? That's right. So the first important lesson when it comes to problem solving is observation. So when you when you just look at them as shapes, then you forget that you know uh, when somebody gives you a problem, when you just try to solve the problem in just you know in in one dimension, then uh, many times you miss out on the obvious one. But instead, we just came up with a very simple hack that sort of lets you draw the shape without having to lift your pencil off of the paper. Is that right? So did you like it? Did you like this trick that we just did? So I'm sure you'll not be able to appreciate this right now, but I'm sure when you go to, when you study mathematics or computer science uh, in, in college, uh, you'll probably study something called as graph theory. And I, I, the rest is just gonna be mystery. I'm just not gonna go deep into that, but this is one very important result you'll learn, uh, which has a lot of applications, right? So uh, I'm not gonna go deeper into the applications aspects of this, but I'm just gonna talk about, uh, okay. So I'm just gonna uh, move on to the next problem. That's going to be a little more interesting. Uh, if we have time, we can circle back to, to this later. Maybe we can talk about where you can use this. And this would have obvious applications in your everyday life. You are actually solving this problem in your mind every single day without even knowing that you're actually solving this. So many interesting problems are like that. Okay, so now let me, uh, so do you all, did you all understand the solution to the problem? Cool, okay. So now this is my favorite problem. I was introduced to this problem when I was in my uh, 10th standard. I call it the 10 coin problem. So I'm going to describe this problem to you. Right. Okay. So I have 10 coins that are all exactly alike. So I have pictures of 10 coins. All of them are alike. But exactly one of uh, these coins is defective. So exactly one of these 10 coins has a different weight from the other. They look exactly alike, but one of them could be defective. So the defective coin, coin could be heavier or it could be lighter, right? So do we understand this? Yes or no? Yes, so, so do all of us understand this? Cool. So what do you think the problem could be? Can someone guess the problem already? So just whether the coin is heavier or lighter. That's right. So you would want to identify the defective coin and then you have to report if the coin is heavier or lighter. So I give you a physical balance. You all know what a physical balance is? Have you all seen it? Right. I'm sure Anand Imam would have seen it. She's a physics teacher, so she would have used this umpteen number of times. But have you all seen it? If not, once the uh, school gets back to normal, regular mode, bug your teacher, ask them to take you to the physics lab or the chemistry lab, and then they'll have a physical, a physical balance, right? So it has two pans, uh, and then you just have to, uh, uh, you can, I don't give you any sort of weight that a physical balance has, but uh, you can weigh two uh, quantities against each other. So do you know how to weigh this? 
So let's say I give you, uh, let's say I give you two uh, objects. I want to find out the heavier one. How would you do it? Can someone tell me that? We can place the two objects on the measuring weight and which goes up, it's, uh, it's lighter and which goes down, it's heavier. Brilliant. So I'm just using, uh, I, I, I wouldn't know the exact uh, weight of the object. I'm not interested in knowing that. I just want to know the heavier one so you can weigh, you can weigh them relatively, right? So now I give you a physical balance. Can you identify the defective coin? Yes or no? So if you, so Vaishali says no, is that right? So I give you a physical balance. Yeah. So can you can you tell me why you cannot get, get guess the weight? Okay. So I give you a physical uh, balance. I give you ten coins, and then I want you to find out the defective coin. It, just one of them is defective. So how would you do it? Keep one the which is not a defective coin. You have to keep in one uh, one bowl and another which is defective. You have to keep in another bowl so we can find. So you them. don't know. So you don't know the defective one, but you can just try with all the ten coins, and then probably when the pan goes up, uh, you can say this could be the defective one, right? Is that what you're trying to say? Maybe it goes up or down. So you can do that. Now, here's the caveat. You can use the physical balance only three times. Now, can you, can you guess the defective coin? Will you be able to do it? Um, for the first time, can we split the 10 coins into five and five? And whichever weighs more or less, we can know that, okay, this side has the heavier, um, the defective coin. I mean. you, so, you sort of got it, but I tell you, you don't know if the coin is defective or not. You, sorry, you don't know if the, if the defective coin is heavier than the other coins or lighter than the other coins. So how would you... But either way, it's not going to be balanced, right? So we just divide it five and five. That's right. So one pan goes up, which, is yeah. the, which contains the defective one. So you don't know if the defective coin, coin is heavier or lighter than the others, but uh, as Abhirami suggested, you could put five coins in the left pan and five coins in the right pan, and then you can see one of them would obviously go up and the other would go down. In either case, this is going to happen, right? So now, how, how would you know if the coin is defective or not, or which pan contains the defective coin? Is that a fair thing to say? So do you see? Uh, what would happen if you just split them five and five? In the second time, we can split the coin which is going down and then divide that into two and three and we can double it. So again, you sort of assume that the coin is, the, the defective coin is heavier. What if the defective coin is lighter? In that case, you should probably consider the pan that goes up, right? But I see you're all thinking in the right line. So you know that you should divide the, you should group the coins in some sense, right? Okay. So, okay. So now, uh, sorry, someone wanted to answer? Yeah, Abhirami again. Do you want to answer? Yeah. If we remove a coin, say, um, are we allowed to remove you can remove, but you yeah. can you can use the physical balance only three times. So that's the catch. Don't depend on luck then. Luck that it's going to get balanced. So if you leave your life to luck, uh, then you sh you don't have to study. You don't have to you don't have to do anything. Luck would take care, right? So uh, constraints like this come in life often. So you should you should never leave it to luck. You should do your best, right? So I give you, you should, so I tell you, you should use, you can use the physical balance three times, but you should devise a strategy. So the whole point about this uh, 10 coin problem is to devise, is devising a strategy. So I'm gonna give you uh, the solution sketch. 
I'm not going to solve all the possible uh, cases, but let's just give it a shot, right? Okay. So I'm going to label each of these coins. I'm going to label them from C sub one to C sub 10. So there are 10 coins, each of them get a label. So one of these 10 coins is going to be the defective one, right? I say we'll split this coin into sets of three, right? So you'd have one group containing coins C1, C2, and C3, and then you would have uh, the second group containing coins C4, C5, and C6, and the third group containing coins C7, C8, and C9, and finally the last group contains just one coin, that's C10. Is that all clear? Right. So now I'm going to weigh C1, C2, C3 against C4, C5, C6. So the left pan is going to contain C1, C2, C3, and the right pan is going to contain C4, C5, and C6. So what are the three possibilities? Can, some, can someone tell me what are the three possible ways the balance could look like? Both the set will be equal, right. and one is lighter, and one is heavier. Awesome, cool. So if C1, C2, C3, it's the weight of C1, C2, C3 is less than the weight of C4, C5, C6. What does that mean? Wonderful, right? So the next case is this, C1, C2, C3 is heavier than C4, C5, C6. So what this means is that the defective coin is in C1, C2, C3, C... So it's one of these six coins. And the defective coin is definitely not C7, C8, C9, and C10. That's what we can confirm. But we still don't know what the defective coin is, right? What is the third possibility? Oops. What is the third possibility? They would be balanced. What does that mean? Then the C7, right? other three will be the defective. Right, so the defective coin is going to be C7, C8, C9, or C10. So it's one of these four coins. So now what do you think should be the next step? You weigh one of these sets against uh, C7, C8, C9. That's right. Uh, okay. So you should probably, is this what you're trying to suggest? Yeah. Right. So now I'm just going to look at two coins. I'm going to weigh weigh C7, C8. Uh, we don't know anything about C7, C8, C9, and C10 yet. Uh, we know that it contains the defective coin, but that's what we're going to identify, right? So we are going to weigh C7, C8 against C9, and it could be any of these coins from the first six. So why are we doing this? That's right, cool. So now, again, this would have three possibilities, right? So the pants could be balanced, or the pan could, the, they could be one, one pan could go up and the other pan could be down. So there are three possibilities. So one is that C7, C8 is greater than C9, C1, or C7, C8 is balanced, which would mean that C7, C8 is equal to C9, C1, or C7, C8 is lighter than C9, C1. Okay, so this is the first case. So what would this mean? So if C7, C8 is lighter than C9, C1, what is one uh, possibility that you can eliminate? They're not equal, and hence they definitely contain the um, defective coin. That's wonderful, right? And you would you just by symmetry you can see the same thing right so if c7 c8 is greater than c9 c1 c10 is not it's not the defective coin so the defective coin is is between these three coins right and finally if they're equal what does that mean c7 c8 is equal to c9 and c1 what would that mean c10 is the defective right coin. so one possibility is that c10 is the defective coin but have, have you solved the problem yet? Sorry? Kevin, we still have the other coins left, right? No, so 
for this case, when C7, C8 is equal to C9, C1, what does that mean? This means that all are defective. Oh, no, see, so C7, C8 is equal to C9, C1. So this would mean that C1 and C9 have the same weight, right? So C10 is the defective coin. Does that make sense? So how many of you agree to this point? How many of you think that C10 is the defective co coin? Cool, so I can see a few thumbs up. So C10 is the defective coin. So now we've still not solved the problem yet. So we still have to find out the defect, if the defective coin is lighter or heavier than the others. So how would you do it? So we, we know that C10 is the defective coin. So how do you, how do you think we're gonna do it now? The other coins in one balance and That's right, I think you cracked it. So you could just weigh C1 against C10. So if C1 goes down, then it means that C10 is heavier. And if C1 goes up, C10 is lighter. So that's what it means, right? I've, so I've not completely solved this problem. So this is just one possibility, but can you actually see the global structure in this problem? So if you just fill out this tree, you would have, uh, solved all possibilities. You can easily identify the defective coin. Does that make sense? Or is it just some interesting picture out there for you? So do you see the tree-like behavior? So each step would have three options and then just three veins are enough to answer all, you know, go through all possibilities. Yes or no? Conditional probability, right, sir? Sorry? It's a bit like conditional probability, right? Conditioned on what? So there's no probability here. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Everything is deterministic. So probability is when you say a certain event is going to happen with a, with a set rate or this is going to happen with a chance. There's no chance here. At the end of the day, there's just one... Uh, case that is going to be true depending on how you're going to label the coin so probability is then every outcome has a chance associated with that so there's no probability here because this is exactly one of this that is going to be true so this is deterministic so there's no probability associated with that but that's an interesting question so now maybe after the talk is over I'm going to send this slide to uh, Anandi Map and she'll circulate it to you all. Will you all try to complete this tree for me? Will you will you try and uh, answer or you know complete this tree by solving all possible cases? So this is just one case that has solved. So you should there's there's a possibility that C1 could be the defective coin. There's a possibility that C2 is the defective coin. So how would you how would you identify if C1 were the defective coin? And how would you identify if C2 were the defective coin? So likewise for all, all the other nine coins. Can you do that? It's going to be one giant chart that you'll all create. But I think this is a very interesting thought experiment. You all want to do it? Definitely, sir. OK. So before I, I wind up, I have a few more interesting problems, but for the want of time, I'm just not going to go deeper into it. I'm just going to uh, give you a few uh, venues where you can learn to program. Uh, you don't have to go to a computer class, or you don't have to have an instructor to learn programming. Programming is just like any other language. So I, I know, I mean, with human languages, I can talk only English and Tamil. But I'm sure if I watched a lot more Hindi movies, I'd be able to talk Hindi as well. So it's just like that. So if you practice hard, you can pick up any language. So I'm sure all of you will have a computer. So Code Academy is one such website. And then there's Google, uh, Code with Google, which is an interesting platform for you to learn any language of your choice. Uh, and then this is Python's official uh, website where you can learn uh, Python programming. Uh, 
this is our official website, but this is uh, a, an interactive website where you can learn Python programming language. If you don't know any programming language, if you don't know any language, I would say you could you should start with Python. You can learn other languages uh, on the fly, but just start with Python. You you guys play on the uh, mobile and the all kinds of video games that you all play. So if you know how to install those, you'll as well be able to install the Python toolkit. And then there's Greek code camp. I'm just not gonna repeat these names. I'm, I'm gonna give you these slides. You just have to visit these websites to see which one suits your needs. And uh, to solve interesting problems like I, uh, I discussed previously, you could look into these uh, uh, online uh, platforms where people post different kinds of problems and then you're, you're required to code. Uh, there's of course these two websites that my favorite, one is Project Oilers and the other is uh, Cut the Knot, where different interesting problems like the 10 coin problem. And then instead of the 10 coin, somebody gives you the 12, sorry, somebody gives you 12 coins, you'll have to find out uh, the defective coin and 12 coins. And there are like, many different problems out there. So these do not require any computer programming. All you have to do is just, you know, just take a cup of tea and then try solving these problems. So, and finally, there are a few book suggestions. Go to the local library and then see if these books are available. Uh, I, I mean, Scientific American is one interesting, uh, rich resource for these problems. Uh, I'm sure, uh, if you if you can convince your principal, she'll get you these books uh, in the library. You can all solve these problems there. Uh, I'm just not gonna uh, bore you with any more of these details, but I'm just gonna open up for questions now. So, did you all like the uh, problems that I shared? Uh, would you like to solve more problems like these? We can regroup again. Yes, sir. Cool. So, if you have questions on anything. It could be on the problems that we solved today, or it could be uh, on generally about computing and problem solving, or it could be on cybersecurity, bring it on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harikara Subramaniam. Are you done with the presentation? Yes, I'm done with the presentation. Uh, okay, thank uh, you I'll, so much. I'll forward the slides to you later. Uh, you can share it with the children. Uh, definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. So kind of you. Uh, over to Mrs. Uh, Malarvi, uh, our computer science faculty. Uh, probably she will act as a moderator uh, during this Q&A section uh, exclusively on uh, global cyber safety and security. Over to you, Malarvi. Ma'am, you're muted. Uh, Ma'am, you're muted. Mrs. Malarvi. Thank you, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity. Let's begin with Mohana Priya's class nine. She's interested in doing programming and also has a great interest in drawing. Thank you, Malabriya. Hi, Anna. Thank you, Malabriya, for this wonderful introduction. My question for you is, Anna, um, how do we suspect an email message we receive as a phishing attempt? So when they usually ask you personal questions, when they tell you that answer this email, fill this survey, and then I'm going to give you uh, a thousand rupee Amazon voucher or whatever, then you know that it's, it's, it's a deliberate phishing attack. I'm sure you'd have received all kinds of WhatsApp forwards that tell you spin the wheel uh, and then you'll get uh, one followed by so many zeros. Uh, you know, all kinds of messages are usually phishing attacks. Uh, so when you see that, you just have to forward it to your spam. You shouldn't open those. Even if you open, it's okay, but just don't click on any of these links. Thank you, Anna. You're welcome. Yeah. Can I have the next question? Subhashini of Standard 9. She is a good reader and a narrator of our school. She wants to know about software updating. Let's hear from her. Thank yeah. you, Mamas. Hello, Anna. Hi. This is Subhashini of grade 9. And I would like to ask the question that, what do we mean to update my computers and software? So, so basically, the computer is not just software. It also ha has a, 
it has a hardware it's- associated with that, right? So each of these software has a certain performance requirement. As you age, your computers also age. And if you, as your computers age, they might not, they might not be able to uh, function very efficiently. So the software developers, they tend to release versions updates that is going to be compatible with all kinds of hardware. And they could also be uh, software bugs that they've detected and fixed. And they could, they could be different kinds of improvements that they have done to uh, make the best utilization of the hardware it is running on. It could, it, it could also contain different kinds of new features that added on to the existing software. That's one possible uh, uh, update that they can do to the existing software. So there are many different reasons why one would want to update your software. Uh, so basically that is what uh, it means to update your software. But one thing that you should really watch out for is that uh, you should only update softwares that you have installed in your computer. Like, so don't believe in all kinds of updates that uh, you receive in emails and things like that. Uh, your system would actually tell you if there's an operating system update or if there's a software update, when you open that software, the software will tell you that there's a new version and it'll ask you, it'll prompt you to uh, install the latest update and things like that. Uh, you shouldn't really trust the kind of updates that you get from all kinds of third-party software vendors. So that's what it means to update your software. Hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Um, is it always... Is... Yeah, go on. I think you're breaking. Looks like uh, she has a network issue. Probably. Yeah, Subhashini, we did not hear you. Do you want to repeat your question again? Yes. Yeah. Subhashini. So I think she's breaking. So could you try uh, talking with your video off? That would reduce the bandwidth. Just turn off your video and talk. We'll still be able to hear you. Can you try doing that one? Yeah. The safety feature for my system? I only heard safety feature for my system. <laughs> what was before that? Subhashini, we heard only a part of your uh, question. You could Subhashini. also type into the chat box. One yes. The uh, other teachers could uh, read it out for you, if that works. Can we circle back to Subhashini at the end again? Can we go on to the Yeah, next probably. Question? Probably. That is what even I'm thinking. Yeah. Somebody mm -hmm. else could ask. We could give the chance to Subhashini a bit later. Yeah. We'll, we'll circle back to her later. The next question comes from Pradeshini of Classman, who is very good in math and a good speaker. Hello, Pradeshini. Thank you so much, Miss, for this wonderful introduction. Hello, Anna. And this Hi. is Pradeshini of Grade 9. I am proud to interact with you, Anna. And here is my question. Is it safe to use the internet at my local library? How far is it safe, Anna? So it depends on what you're browsing in the internet. Uh, generally, it is safe uh, many of these times. It's not like uh, uh, it, usually people don't spread viruses through Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi is fairly safe. They have a security layer, layer but one thing that could go wrong is uh, if it's a public internet, it is very likely that people get to know, that the administrators could get to know what you're actually browsing. So I would actually say uh, in, in some sense, there's a, there's a stack of security that is built on the, on the site that you're browsing. So even if it means to means that you're entering all kinds of passwords and everything, usually they don't breach. But in general, it's, it's always not nice when people know what you're actually browsing. So your history is something that's very personal. And 
when when people get to know that they could misuse that so that's the only thing that you should watch out for but i think in general you can go ahead and use it thank you anna yeah so back vaishalya class 9 she is a good orator she she put forth a very thoughtful query now you can speak vaishali hello vaishali thank you malam is for wonderful intro vaishali vaishali we are not able to hear you thank you malamals for the wonderful introduction you can Hi, hello. hello this is vaishali from grade 11 grade 9 can you please tell oh. us how the cyber safety has been implemented in your place Sure. So uh, I mean, so cyber safety is a very wide area, and it's it's one of the hot areas right now. And uh, it's not just about uh, the institution wanting to implement measures to prevent uh, cyber attacks, but it also starts with governance. So um, at least in the United States, there are specific cyber laws that that tell you what is a crime. It defines. specifically what, what what events could be classified as a cyber crime in the internet so uh so what i'm trying to get at is if we actually go down that path then we'll have to discuss on different aspects of cyber crime and then what what it means to be safe on the internet and things like that but i can give you one example where online stalking has been uh reported especially when uh when minors have in have been tormented to such uh attacks so there are officials that actually walk around in the internet without us knowing but they can still catch if people are misusing uh minors so so that's one example that i would like to elucidate but the question by itself is really uh pretty wide and that would For, that would actually warrant a discussion in itself but it's an interesting question we could talk about it in detail probably uh, at a different time thank you anna you're welcome here we have deepika of class 11 she wants to become a siddha doctor and so the poor and needy over to you deepika hello thank deepika. you miss hi anna thank you miss for a wonderful opportunity Here is my question, Anna. What can I do to protect myself from cyber crime? Uh, so the basic thing is the, the, the most important thing when it comes to protecting oneself from being a victim of cyber crime is to be aware of what constitutes to a cyber crime. Uh, and as you say, if safety starts from you, so you should know what you're actually browsing, and then you should know the kind of the the digital trace that you leave behind so uh it it could be as simple as not opening spam emails it could be as simple as not installing uh, uh unauthorized software in your machine that could actually extract information that you have so unless the software is, uh has been recommended uh, uh and then unless the software is approved uh to use you shouldn't actually use it it should be certified for use right so it it cannot be any stray software and then you cannot just download a software from the internet and then install it in your computer they are very likely to uh, extract data from your computer and then just send it across uh, that is just one example of how safe it can be but the most important thing is to understand what constitutes to a cyber crime and the different ways in which people could tap your computer to extract information so one simple example is they could we we do see a lot of ads in certain websites but uh you shouldn't usually click on those ads and then they could take you into some malicious website that could listen to your computer 
So that's one way you could probably install ad blockers to block some of these ads. So that's just an example. But the most important thing is to be aware of uh, what constitutes to a cyber attack or a cyber crime. Thank I hope that answers your question. Yeah. yeah, sure. Now we have a question from Good Narrator in PhD of Standard 11 on techniques and problem solving. Sure. Thank you, Malar, very much for such a nice intro. Hello, Anna. Here I have Hi. a question on problem solving. Can you say what are the most effective ways to solve a problem? So I think that's what I've been discussing uh, today. So the most effective, the most important step towards problem solving is first problem understanding. Uh, and then it's not about always finding the right answer, but it's the thought process that leads you to the, to the right answer. Uh, if you actually glance through a computer science book that would throw different kinds of terms for different kinds of methods. But I would say, always start from the problem, try to understand it, and then uh, look at all kinds of, look at all possible information that you can obtain from the problem. Right. So this is a this is again a very generic question, but when you when you take a specific area like algorithm development, there are always different kinds of techniques. So I think that comes with practice. So I would say, expose yourself to different kinds of problems. Expose yourself to different kinds of uh, make your keep your mathematics foundation fairly strong. Uh, and I think that will help you solve different kinds of problems efficiently. I think at this age, the most important thing is to understand what you're doing. It's not just about, so because today I discussed the 10 coin problem, it's not that all problems that involve coins should be solved this way. So you should probably think about why I said there are going to be, why I'm grouping my coins in threes and why not four, four and two. That's one possible question that should probably come to you. So such is the kind of training you probably require in order to be able to solve problems. Thank you. I'm glad that you asked that question. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have Kumuda Priya of class 11 who has very interesting vocal music and exploring scientific concepts. Over to Kumuda Priya. Namaste, Anna. Hello. Um, before I'm starting my question, I want to say thank you for you for spending a, your precious time with us. And the section was very interesting. And my question is, how we can detect cyber attacks and are there any easy ways to identify and respond them? So usually, uh, I, I, I mean, before I answer your question, thank you for the nice words. I think it means so much to me. Um, there's no one possible way to detect a cyber attack, right? So it could be, uh, you could receive emails and then you could have just opened them and then you might have entered, the, entered your bank details. You might have entered all kinds of sensitive information. So many of these times a cyber attack would begin with that. Or you, uh, I, I would say nothing would happen without your notice. So unless you voluntarily give out your data, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't have gone out to people, right? So, but uh, the way in which the data was gathered from you might be a very malicious method. So I think you can always launch, uh, when you know sensitive data has, uh, has gone out of you or your system to, to, uh, to people that you don't know, then you could probably go and file a, a complaint uh, against such attacks. Uh, but once the data, the data that is gone is, gone, you, you cannot uh, traverse it is what I'm trying to tell you. So keep strong passwords, keep strong, um, make sure that, so when you know a certain data is leaked, go back and change your password so that people cannot access it. That's the most important thing that you should do. So for, just for an example, keep strong passwords. Um, even for the Zoom call, I think the password was one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's the most common password that people generally have all over the place. So it begins with simple steps like that. So, uh, but, it, but in, in some sense, cyber attack, people don't tell you that there's going to be a cyber attack and then launch a cyber attack. 
just a part of your everyday life. You should just be aware of such attacks. So it's just like a pickpocket in a bus, right? You wouldn't know if somebody picked your pocket, right? Nobody gives you an advance notice and then picks your pocket. It doesn't happen that way. But 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 again, it happens very rarely in one's lifetime, right? It's just become a part of our lives and we should just learn to live with that. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. Kanishka class has Kanishka class 11 has won number of prizes in global competition and is very good in math. She wants to explore more about the online program. Over to Kanishka. Hello. Kanishka. I think she also seems to have a network issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe we can circle back to Kanishka a little while later. Yeah. Can we go, go forward to the next question? Yes, exactly. Okay, so I think I've been requested to stop the gallery view, so let me do it. Let me stop my uh, screen sharing. Okay, I think this is better. Sorry, I didn't notice that much. Yeah, no, that doesn't matter. Uh, Abhirami, uh, she's a grade 11 student. Probably uh, you can ask your question, Abhirami. So, uh, I'll ask my question now. Hi, Anna. Uh, this might not be much of a technical question, but following up with all the questions on cybercrime, I'd like to know what you think of ethical hacking. I mean, it, I mean it's a growing concern for so many co countries around the world. Um, Cybercrime is becoming such a big thing now. So do you think ethical hacking might help counter cybercrimes? I would think so. I mean, that's a good uh, question. So for all the others in the audience, let me tell you what ethical hacking is. So ethical hacking is when uh, the company that develops the software pays people to hack the software, right? So instead of having someone else break the system, if you pay someone else, if you pay yourself uh, to break the system, you could sort of understand what is the potential uh, loopholes for malicious uh, hackers to enter into the system. So I think that's a, a, a very good investment in some sense. So you could potentially warn all your users uh, the possible attacks that they could expect, the possible loopholes through which people can enter your system. So I think ethical hacking is done by all kinds of companies. So let's say Microsoft might have its own ethical hacking team. Amazon might have its own ethical hacking team that will try to break the system through different kinds of attacks. Uh, it is ethical because they, they are hackers, but they are, it is ethical because they're doing it for the purpose of fixing uh, the loopholes in these software. So I think ethical hacking, I welcome ethical hacking. It's not really uh, a bad thing after all. Though it contains hacking, it's, it's still fine. So yeah, that's one possible uh, uh, solution to, to all kinds of hacking that people face. That's a good point. Thank you for bringing it up. Thank you for spending your time with us. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, Subhashini, probably Subhashini, is your network better now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I think it's. Uh, Thank you. Marlos. Hi, Anna. Hello. This is Subhashini of Grade 9. And I would like in my computers and software. Is it always a safety feature? Uh, it depends who is actually rolling out the update. So let's say you use. Uh, Windows operating system, and if Microsoft gives you an update, it is very likely that it's a safety feature. Uh, but if somebody else gives you an update for for your for your Windows operating system, then it is very likely that it is rigged. So 
it depends on who gets the update. So if you should, uh, th that, that's the kind of certificate I'm talking about, right? So if the one that gets you the update is credible enough, then probably it's a, it's a feature. So if the, if the software developer that built the system gets you an update, then it's very likely that it's a safety feature. Otherwise, it's, you, you, you can never guarantee on its safety. I hope that answers your question. Um, I think she dropped off because of- uh, Yes, uh, network issue. Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, yes. Are there any more questions, Marla Rui, from yes. children? Yes, this is the last question from Rakshita class 11. Last year to be a doctor. Over to Rakshita. Thank you, Manal for the wonderful introduction. Hi, Anna. I am Rakshita from Laman. I would ask you, I would like to ask you a question. How can we learn to how can we learn to do privacy setting in the internet, Anna? Uh, so I think each browser that you use has its own set of menu where you can go and uh, set information like, uh, so, so when you say privacy, can you can you clarify that a little, little bit? So what do you mean by privacy? Probably she means uh, to prevent others from accessing her device uh, sort of, or using her own uh, uh, login IDs, credentials to uh, access that particular page in her absence sort of. Is it what you mean, Ma? Yes, ma'am. So, so basically, uh, when multiple people share a device, how would you make sure that there is no breach of privacy? Cool. So I think uh, at least uh, to the best of my knowledge, all major operating systems let each individual create their own account, right? And any software that is in installed by that particular individual cannot be shared. It's not accessible to other people uh, sharing that device. So I would say create multiple logins. So if there are four people accessing the device, then each person should have their own login. And then the best thing is, I think the one thing that we all take for granted is the passwords, and we tend to share passwords like it is water with everybody. So please do not share your passwords. So keep them safe. It's like your it's like your bank uh, password. You wouldn't, you wouldn't give that to anybody, right? So as you would keep it to yourself, just keep it to yourself, change your passwords often. And if you really want to protect people from not accessing your device, then you shouldn't share your password with anyone. I think it begins there. And, and there are also parental controls. So I think it's a session for the parents where they can know what kind of software and what kind of websites that it, that they, that their minor children can visit. So they can lock their computer and then give you preferential access. That's also there. So uh, depending on the audience, I would turn either way. I would think either way. So yeah. Thank you, Anna. You're welcome. Uh, and uh, when, when we were discussing about password, I think one thing I need to mention, many a times what we do is, uh, no, for uh, simplicity, for the sake of remembering, uh, that was one reason, you know, uh, easy to access, easy to type, uh, simplified uh, passwords are used. Uh, and probably even I personally have the habit of writing the password on the wall so that I don't forget wherein there are multiple. No, this is a time probably even I will have to rethink on uh, my procedure regarding uh, password uh, usage and uh, changing of passwords. Right. So, uh, your web browser, your Chrome can remember your passwords for you. You can probably <laughs> trust Google with that or you can write all your passwords in a in a notepad and then just remember one master password you don't have to remember all passwords but i know remembering passwords is a pain uh but it is also not difficult to even if you forget your password you could retrieve it it's not a herculean task as such but i think you shouldn't expose your passwords you shouldn't take it granted take it for granted so just keep your password safe and secure but I think when it comes to cybersecurity, the most important thing begins with you. So you decide what content to give out. You decide whether or not you want to give out a certain picture of yours or uh, your phone number to people. So uh, safety begins with you. So you, you should actually 
have an awareness of what kind of information you would want to put it out there in the world wide web <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hariharan. Uh, now, uh, probably since it is an Alivmina initiative, it's very apt that uh, we have uh, Ms. Priyanka, uh, who is also alumni of the school, but uh, now a faculty member in the Department of English, uh, thanking you. Uh, over to you, Priyanka. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, first of all, I personally got so much of information from the session. Like I learned so many things, not only students, but as a teacher, we learn so many things today. So we make sure that we take all those points and uh, follow follow it throughout our uh, throughout our lifetime, right? So all those small 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 tips which you shared was so informative, and it was it will be very useful for us. And first of all, I I take much privilege in thanking our school management for arranging this uh, uh, wonderful session on the topic of uh, problem solving, online programming. with a question and answer session on uh, global cyber safety and security i whole heartedly thank our ma'am principal anand mani ma'am for creating such a platform star arihara subramaniam who had given us wonderful inputs about drop yes it was very each points told by him yes and uh, we are very lucky to have you sir Yes, and I extend my thanks to all the teacher who are behind this program, and I appreciate and thank our dear students for their active participation throughout the session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. I just would like to take a moment to thank uh, Purnima, ma'am, who is not here, but uh, I think she's a very dear uh, professor of ours. And um, I, I thank Purnima, ma'am, for putting me in touch with Anandi, ma'am, who made this who made this session possible. it was also wonderful interacting with the students i hope i was able to convey my my thoughts at least fairly okay and i hope we can say we had fun with problem solving today i think we can all give a thumbs up out here oh thank you so much <laughs>